The scripture reading this morning is read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. And if you'd like to follow it in the Bible in front of you, it can be found on page 1043, which I'll encourage you to follow. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may, be, you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in knowledge, in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bill. I want to say thank you to the praise team, specifically the Rose. I don't know if you knew this, but they were moving this week, and they have other jobs and they have other stuff. So for them to fill in for Sam, as he is out this week, um, took a great effort on their part. And um, so, wherever y'all are, there you are. Thank you very much for the work. Um, sure, yeah, you can clap for that. So, um, so we are in this series. Um, that we've entitled This I Believe. If you just joined us, this is our sixth week in this. And last week, what I introed with, I, I talked to you guys about how it was the week after Easter, and usually we go to Easter, and, and um, hopefully the goal for Easter is that you uh, join with all the other saints around the world and celebrate what Christ has done. And hopefully that the celebration of that uh, leaves you and your family leaving and exiting any campus on the church, wherever church or whatever church you went to, um, uh, sort of on this spiritual high. And then what happens typically in the American church is we have this great Resurrection Day celebration and then life happens and things begin to get crowded out and then we show up the next week and we're like, what happened? And we talked about how one of the things that that Satan does to work against us and to take that joy is he gets us from looking at the promises of heaven to looking at the realities of the present. And he gets us all worked up and thinking and looking and focusing only on the here and the now where all throughout scripture we are told to lift up our eyes. And we saw that there's a promise indeed, this hope of heaven Today, we're going to look at sort of uh, pushing through that hope and what that means. But I want to start by just um, telling you about some special moments I had as a dad. As a dad, uh, for many of you dads out there, moms, dads, grandparents, you, you probably can relate to this in, in some way. But I remember seeing my daughter for the first time. One, I couldn't believe it was a daughter. We were convinced it was going to be a boy. So when the baby came out, the nurses looked at me like said, it's time to tell the mom what it is. I'm like, that, that's a girl, right? And so it was this surprising moment where, but I couldn't believe it. I wanted a daughter so badly and I just didn't think we would have a daughter. And we had a daughter, and I remember the first time I held her and looked at her, and her eyes just looked at me like, I'm already smarter than you. Like, it was like this, like, just this, you can tell that my daughter, I got my kids' permissions to talk about this, I could tell that there's already in her brain this working out, like, I'm here on this world to help figure things out, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to try to think through things, and I could just see it on her, and I, it was a beautiful thing to watch her. I remember when my son was born, the same thing. I remember just being overwhelmed that I get both a daughter and a son. I can't believe this, and I just remember holding him, and I could even see then that there was this, this sort of zeal. I can't wait to start living like it was, I don't know, I'm a dad, I'm reading all that into it, right? But I'm, that's what I'm picturing. I'm picturing this little bitty baby and all of the, the future that waits. And I remember coming home 
from work when they had been growing and I'd walk in and see my wonderful, precious thinker daughter on the floor in the kitchen and pots and pans and wooden spoons and plastic stuffs all over the kitchen and it's just nothing but noise and mess. And she, when I turned the corner and I remember looking at me like, look what I've done. Look what I get to do. And I remember thinking, oh, that's so precious. You're so great. You're so gifted, all this kind of stuff. I remember on her birthday after the party one day, looking at her, sacked out completely at a desk, and she had, been, she had drawn all over the paper, and she was drooling like crazy. And I remember thinking, oh, how precious. I love watching her develop and grow. And I remember my son one day, same thing, like different day actually, but same kind of idea, walking in, turning the corner, and my son, depending on the day, He was always dressed, ready to fight. I would come home, and whether it was Captain America or Spider-Man or uh, I forget all the other things that he was dressed up in, but, but one of the things that was no doubt his favorite was a particular time when he would don the fierce, the mighty Captain Feather Sword apparel. For anybody who knows the Wiggles, you know who that is. So he'd have his pirate hat on, he'd be on the bed, he'd have a sword, and he's ready to go to war against Dad. I remember thinking, how cute, how precious. He thinks he could win, and this is neat, and, and he still thinks that. But I remember like walking and going through that. I remember watching my son watch and be captivated by the Wiggles, and my daughter being captivated by baby Einstein, and watching them develop and their minds grow. I remember watching the progress of them go from crawling to walking. And I remember hearing from a dad that had gone before me, he said, you think it's fun watching them to develop physically? Wait until you get to watch them develop their language, when they learn the alphabet, when they go to school. And one by, somebody told me, and I've repeated this to other new parents, you can't just wait till they can learn to bathe themselves. You've inherited a whole two hours in your day. And, and like the, the development, the progress of your children brings you a lot of joy as a dad. Even today, when I see my kids do things that I couldn't do when I was their age and do and experience, and, and I just am amazed that they've developed and grown. When I come to this text and when I look at Colossians chapter 1, what I see is sort of this spiritual father who's writing back and he has this sincere genuine interest and care for these people. We see just how deep the well of love and concern goes for them when we look at verse 9. When he writes to them, for this reason also, since the day we heard this, talking about them knowing the gospel, the power of the gospel, we haven't stopped praying for you. That's That's crazy. Think about that. We haven't stopped praying for you. Since we first heard about your birth in the faith, we have been so ecstatic for you, about you, that we can't stop praying for you. We keep praying for you. In fact, I'm writing to you now from jail. I'm locked up and I'm not praying for certain things. I'm praying for you. What are they concerned with? What are they asking? Well, I'm asking that because he answers it right here in verse 9. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. What is it that Paul is praying for what is it that they're asking God from the first day that they were born until now well let me share with you a few things that he's not asking for when he's writing to this new church this baby church he's not asking and he's not praying for more numbers he's not saying God let them reach a thousand 
He's not praying for them to be popular in the community because he knows he's in jail. He's in chains for Christ. That if he's a follower of Jesus, that means they hated Jesus. They're probably not going to like us. He's not praying for their popularity or for them to be culturally relevant. He's not praying for more money. He's not saying, I hope you get your act together and you get you a nice financial plan. Can't wait for you to show off your budget. He's not praying for them to have a good strategic plan. He's not even really praying for them to showcase their growth. What he cares about the most, what he's praying constantly and consistently about, he is their call to spiritual growth. He is praying for their spiritual growth. So this week we are looking at this, I believe, in the important call to spiritual growth. We're going to first define what spiritual growth is, what we mean by that. Then we're going to talk about why we believe it's so important that we grow spiritually. And then we're going to look at how this happens. And we're doing all this leading up to a time of communion where we take the Lord's Supper together at the end of our time today. What do we mean by spiritual growth? In Scripture, we notice that there are different ways that describe what we mean by spiritual growth. There's uses like we use the word, there's, we hear the word maturity, talking about Christian maturity, spiritual development, personal holiness, pursuing holiness. The, um, the reformers and people in the Puritans used the word, the phrase especially a lot, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. So we're talking about mortifying sin, killing sin. Lately in the last four decades or so, the phrase spiritual disciplines has grown more and more becoming more like Christ, walking like Christ. But I want us to stick to the letter in Colossians today, mostly. We're going to look in Hebrews once, but all we have to do is look at the language that Paul's using to write to his newly born Christian babies about the call to spiritual growth. In verse 9, he says, we're asking that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we've not stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Let's be honest. I think humanity has been on the quest forever to discover who God is and if we have an idea of who God is, then what is it that this God demands from us? We call it knowing His will. What are His plans for our lives? What are His plans for me as a dad, as a husband, as a guy in this world? What's His purpose for all of this? What's His will? Sometimes we get radical about it, right? We even pray things and say things in our groups. Come on, let's be honest. We say things like, I want to be in the very center of, of his will as if like God's playing darts and those that are in the center of the will get 100 points but those on the outside of the center that that they, they get like 80 points and no the, God's will is God's will you're either in and living God's will or you're out of God's will There's no center and closer it's in the will or out of the will and so Paul is saying I am praying that they are filled with the knowledge of his will the word filled here that Paul uses is an expression that literally means to render full. To fill to the top so that nothing else shall be wanting to full measure. Meaning to fill it so much up that you don't think you can get anything else in. To be rendered full. To be filled to the brim. Paul is saying that he is praying for true spiritual growth, that they be filled to the brim with the knowledge of God. What does this mean to have filled our lives with the knowledge of God? Well, he talks about knowledge of his will, that we'd be growing in all wisdom and all spiritual understanding. This is really good news for us. The fact that Paul is praying this for 
newborn babies. It's like us saying to my daughter, my hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you not just stay on the floor with pans. That if you wanted to play piano, you're not just using your two fingers, but that you develop, that you grow, that you fill your life up with the knowledge of what God has for you, is calling you to be. This is good news for us because this means that it is attainable. Think about that. For any of you who have this week or at certain seasons of your life ever asked, God, what is your will? What do you want for me? Paul shows us right here that he is humbly but confidently praying that he reveal that will to them. Like it's attainable. I love this. He's not only praying for them to be filled with the knowledge of God, he later mentions just how this knowledge is attainable. Look with me in chapter 1, verse 25. We're going to be going throughout this chapter and some in chapter 2 and 3. So if you have your Bibles handy, keep it open to Colossians chapter 1. So we see the prayer. We see what he's saying in in chapter 1, the verse 9. And so look with me in verse 25. He says, regarding the church, talking about them and talking about the church in general, he says, I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to do what? To make the word of God fully known. Not halfway known. Not like, hey, good job this year. No, like fully known. Known. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles, which are these people, the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that they that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So I labor for this striving with his strength remember that that works powerfully within me skip down to verse 2 of chapter 2 i want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding talk about being filled to the brim and have the knowledge of god's mystery which is christ in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge Paul is saying that this is attainable, that the mysteries of God and the gospel can be embraced. He's praying this for them. He's praying for complete understanding. I want you, I'm praying that you be filled to the brim. Again, we see that God wants us to know Him. He wants us to know His will. He is revealing the mystery to us. You can go home today. If you don't learn anything else today, you can at least go home, put your head on the bed and say, you know what, God? I love that you want me to know you. I love that you're going to be teaching me things. That God's not playing this guessing game like, I'm moving over here. I hope you get, oh, you missed me. I'm moving over here. I hope you, no, He's revealing Himself to us. This is what we mean by spiritual growth. The very good news that we are developing and growing in our knowledge of God and His will. Filled to the brim. Why is it so important that we grow spiritually? I mean, isn't it enough that we kind of punch a ticket to heaven? We, we walk an aisle at some camp or in some church and, and we get a card and we check the right box. Let's make sure we check this box, not that box, because we want to make sure the box is what. No, that's not what it's about. It's important because when we give our life to Christ, we begin a journey. We begin to walk. So one reason why spiritual growth is so important, we learn how to walk worthy of the Lord. Look with me the way Paul puts it here. I'm praying these things for you. I haven't stopped praying for them for you. I'm asking that you be filled to the brim with the knowledge of His will, verse 10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. So that your walking will be worthy of Him and therefore be pleasing to Him. 
That's important. We just talked. Our first song that we sang today was about the holiness of God. Like, who's ever cheated him? Who's ever manipulated him? Who's ever forced him to do anything? Who's ever tricked him? No one has. Not even you. So what is the kind of walk that's going to be pleasing to him? What is the kind of walk that's going to be worthy of him? When someone begins to follow Jesus, it's like opening a treasure chest of adventures. Most of the journey is not going to be easy. But first off, we must know what it is that we must be doing as a follower of Christ and what are the things we should not be doing as a follower of Christ. And so the unpacking of the knowledge of God, the unpacking is us growing I remember being in a small group a long time ago and we would have small group right after worship and we'd go to these these um these people's house I almost said their name but what I'm about to say doesn't anyway um so we go to their house and they just had a baby or the baby was like walking now and kind of reaching for things and and uh Kelly probably remember this but um we were there in the in the small group and the 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 house we were at had this big candle and uh Jim I can tell you that the dad um continually the, the the baby would reach for the candle and the fire and he would push the hand down reach for the fire by the third time Jim said you know what it's time for the baby to learn <laughs> like he, it's going to get to some point it's going to get too hot and he's going to learn like the baby has to learn how to walk in a way that's not going to lead his life to destruction the baby's got to grow up of course all of the moms pounced on Jim when this happened. They rescued the baby, pulled it away from the fire, blew the fire out, said, why don't we have a fire when there's a baby in here? Anyway, how shall we now live is the question. How shall we begin to walk is the question that this church is having. What do we do? Well, Paul says, I'm praying for your growth, that you learn how to walk in a way that's fully pleasing to him. Now, what does that mean? That means living a life that's pleasing to God, not necessarily pleasing to people. We have to learn that because our whole life, all we wanted to do is please ourselves. All we wanted to do is please other people. We want to make sure they're happy. We want to make sure we fit in, make sure we're popular, make sure we get accepted into the job, make sure we do whatever we got to do to get the raise. We want to get influence. We want to grow more in that area. And what Paul's saying here is it's time that you learn to walk in a way worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to primarily and only God. You've got to learn that. Doing this means there's going to be a life in which you're walking worthy that's bearing fruit, that's displaying this is what God's done in my life, that's going to even cause you to grow more and more and more in the knowledge of God. I want to read from a text in Hebrews chapter 5. We don't know exactly who the writer of Hebrews is. And in this particular text in chapter 5, I want you to listen to this condemnation. In a way, it's sort of this, this, this speech of, in, in my Translation of the CSB here, the subtitle says, The Problem of Immaturity. Verse 11, Hebrews 5. We have a great deal to say about this, and it is difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Wow. The writer is saying that we have become, or the recipients of this, have become too lazy to understand the, what they're teaching. goes on to say, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. Let me just pause there. The implication there is that you shouldn't still need to be at this level. The implication is you shouldn't always just be a sponge. At some point, you should be at a place in your spiritual growth and your walking where you are now teaching others, leading others. Let me ask you before I even begin, are you still at a point in your journey 
where you're just coming and you're still the baby bird in the nest. Like, there's a part of that I love. There's part of that that's good. I don't want to scare you out of the nest, but I do want you to feed well so that you can begin to fly and soar and go help others. Verse 12 again, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained and trained to distinguish between good and evil. We could say there, somebody that has been filled to the brim of how to walk with Christ. Let me ask you, are you at a point in your life where you're still milk and you're the, the heavy steak of the word, the, uh, the, the deeper protein of knowing who God is, just still kind of is way up here? Well, there's a lot of us that are like that. Churches are filled to this. And Paul was saying, I'm praying that that not be you, Colossae. And as your pastor, I'm praying that by this time next year, you could say, I don't want milk anymore. I want to eat. I want stuff. I want to teach. I want to grow. And that's what Paul is saying to them. That they would walk in a worthy way. That they would eat heavier things and not just require milk another reason why this is important that we grow spiritually is that we could be protected from false teachers back to colossians in chapter two paul goes on look with me as he says i'm going to actually read he says i want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding and then in verse four he says this I am saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. I mean, you, you hear the language here. I don't want you to, to think like a little baby that's just going to just eat up every lollipop that's offered to him. Every candy, everything that sounds sweet. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in the body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you and the strength of your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as your Lord, it's a key word there, continue. Continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. And here it is, overflowing with gratitude. Verse 8. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deceit, based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. One of the reasons why it's so important that we grow spiritually is so that we don't give in to false teachings that take us away from beautiful, beautiful understandings of the grace of God. Have you noticed that false doctrines don't really get us to grow deeper into an awareness of God's grace? They take us away from God's grace and, and make it about works. If you only had more faith, or if you only did this right, you could have this or this, or to shame us away from grace. But a deeper understanding of God takes us into a deeper understanding of His grace. You've heard it said before, probably, that it, do you know how the Secret Service knows how to track counterfeit dollar bills and $50 bills? You, have you heard this before? They can spot counterfeits just by looking at them. It's because they spend much, much time studying the original. When they know the original, they can see the fake. No, oh, that's not real. Why do you know that? How do you know that? Because this is the original. That's fake. That's cheap. It's worth nothing. In fact, it's worth gel time. This is real. That's the point here. Spiritual growth and maturity are so important. So important to teaches us how to walk, that we're growing. It's progress, and it's so important that it protects us from 
false teachings. I believe, like Paul does, that we are called to grow. And so I just want to take a step back, just remember how urgent Paul is about this. In chapter 1, we see that he's not only is he continuing to pray for this, look with me in verse 24. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. I'm, I'm suffering for your growth. I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions of this body, of his body, that is the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Verse 28, again. So we proclaim him. We're warning. We're teaching everyone with all the wisdom so that we may present everybody mature in Christ. And I love the next few words. My call to ministry, whenever I read verse 29 a long time ago, I remember looking at that and I had to ask the question, am I willing to do this for people in the church? He says, I labor for this. I labor for the spiritual maturity of the church. I labor for this striving with all the strength that works powerfully in me. This is Paul's commitment to pray continually for this, to labor for this, to suffer for this. So I think Paul would want the church in Colossae and the church of grace in Salado to know, to be convinced that we believe that spiritual growth is important. So how do we obtain it? Well, the first thing that we need to understand in obtaining this is we, first of all, must make a commitment. First of all, by spiritual commitment, we must make this commitment. Last week, I read to you Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, and I told you this is, we're going to read how it is that we grow spiritually and how we apply this and how we do this. I just want to read through verse 10 here in chapter 3. Listen to the commitment that Paul is saying that he wants them to make. Remember, he says, I'm praying for you. I'm suffering for you. I'm laboring for you. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Pause. So from verses 1 through 5, there are three things, he says, to do, which all require you and I to make a commitment. Seek the things above. Set your mind on things above. A lot of that was last week. And then we come to verse 5. Put to death what belongs to the earth. Well, what does that mean? I want to be filled with knowledge. I don't know what that means. Well, let's keep reading. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away the following. It goes on with another list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Do not Lie to one another since you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Paul is saying to them, I'm praying, I'm suffering, I'm laboring, but you've got to make a commitment. Set your mind on things above set your eyes on things above and put to death all of these things let me ask you church this morning have you could you honestly say that you have put to death 
these things? Now, it doesn't mean that you've walked into this Sunday morning and you could say, yep, I'm perfect. No lust this week. No wrath. No filthy language. It's not what it's saying. It's saying, are you willing to evaluate, to investigate, to examine anything in your life that leads to these things? Then get them out of your house. Get them out of your life. Make a commitment because it's stunting your growth. It's going to keep you on the floor with pots and pans. I want you to rise up. I want you to walk. You've got to put to death these things and look forward and begin walking in truth. Verse 9, he says, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self. Let me translate that. Stop pretending you're a Christian. Just stop it. You don't impress anybody. Even if you do impress some committee or somebody in the church that goes, wow, man, they're, look at Nancy. Look at Teddy. Look at, I don't know, I'm thinking of names, whatever. I'm going in a bad place. But anyway, look at these people. Let's applaud them. Let's promote them. Even if you can convince people in the church, it's not a walk worthy of the Lord. Let's stop pretending. Let's make the commitment. How do we stop growing? I mean, how do we start growing spiritually as we make a commitment? We take seriously the calling. We step into this journey of hope and we step into this journey with others. The second way we do this is we, we do it by intercession with others or by others. We do it by prayer. Let's not forget how we start this and what we keep saying. That Paul is praying for them. He's praying for them. Do you have anyone committed that way to you? Do you have anybody committed to pray for you these things? When I was thinking about this point... My title here is Pastor Preaching and Vision. So part of preaching comes this vision that comes to me. And I just had this, this invitation I feel like I want to share with you guys. So this is, I believe, what God is considering us to do and making a commitment and moving forward. I want you to right now, I want you to think about two people in this congregation that you really like. That's not too hard, is it? Now, not your family. Don't put, like, my wife. No, no. Put, put two people that you like. Put two people that you, that you consider, like, a pleasure to be around. You got them on your mind? Two people? Nobody's doing anything. I don't know. Not seeing this. Nobody's writing anything. Okay. Two people. You got two people in your mind that you like. I want you to also think about two people that you would like to get to know better. Maybe you met somebody during the welcoming time or whatever, and you're like, okay, yeah, there's something about them that really makes me want to get to know them better. So now we're up to four people, okay? So it's two people that you like. Hopefully they're in this room. Hopefully they're belonging to this church. In fact, I want it to be somebody in the church, in our church. And two people you'd like to get to know better. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I want to challenge you. I invite you to... Pray for the spiritual growth of those four people from this day until the end of the year. Do you hear that? That's, that's four people that if you do this, I don't know how many people are here today, 110, whatever, that, that, that's four people that you're praying for their spiritual growth from now. I mean, you're like, Jason, I, don't, I need spiritual growth. We're going to get to that in a minute. But one way you start growing spiritually is you look out among you and say, you know what, I, I don't know what I'm doing exactly, but I can at least pray for them to grow, to be filled with the knowledge of God. Four people, two people you like, two people you would like to know better. I challenge you to pray for them and their spiritual growth. The other thing I want you to do is I want you to think about two people who you believe really care about you that are in this church. Okay, and again, don't put your mom down to other people, not in your family, that you believe really do care for you. 
and two other people that you believe really love Jesus. Maybe this person doesn't know you at all, but you believe what you've seen in that person. Like they, they love Jesus. But now we're back up to four people, right? I want to encourage you. I challenge you to go email, text, face-to-face, Facebook Messenger, whatever you got to do, to go to these four people and ask them, would you please pray for my spiritual growth from now until the end of this year? You got it? Is that easy to understand? I'm asking you to do this. What if? What if this community actually had a church filled with people who cared about growth not numerical growth but actually cared about each other being rooted in the faith what would it look like if central texas had a gathering of people where they literally practiced a commitment to help one another grow in christ What if there was a church that actually grew, yes, in numbers and influence and impact and all that, but not because of the personality of the pastor or not because of the money that came in or not because of some marketing or creative way the staff works, but really the church grew because the people of the church participated in praying for the spiritual growth of each other. What if when we prayed, we came together at night of prayer, yes, we would pray for each other's ailments, pray for each other's conditions, but what if we really pleaded with the Lord, oh God, help so-and-so's spiritual journey. Help them to grow. Paul gave his life to this. He poured out his growth for this. He never stopped praying for this for them. I'm inviting you, church, to join the church in Colossae, to join me, to join the elders in in giving our best and praying for the growth of everybody in this congregation. I've asked you just to consider four people to pray for, four people to pray for you, okay? Okay? How do we do this? Well, we make a commitment. How do we do this? By prayer, which leads to the third thing. How do we do this? By His glorious might. I love that Paul reminds the Colossians that he's praying for them. Yes, I'm praying for you to be strengthened with all the power according to His glorious might. Jesus said that He had the power to lay down His life, and He had the power to raise it up again. He also promised that when He ascends to the Father, that one will come who will be a helper. And that helper will be the Holy Spirit coming to fill us with the power of God, the Holy Spirit doing the work to grow us. Jesus gives us life. He puts us in a family. Holy Spirit gets us walking, He keeps us walking, and He brings us to the end of our journey together. So hear this, God is committed to your growth. Are you? Are you committed to the growth of the person next to you? I believe that we're called to this. I want us to remember a few things as we come to the table to take the Lord's Supper that He wants you to grow. And every time we take this time together, the Lord's Supper, what we're doing is we are confessing a few things. We are saying that we believe that He made a way for us to come to God. That way is Jesus. He laid down His life. He took the hit. He took the punishment. He died so that we can be born again. And because he was without sin, his blood, when it was poured out, was so pure, it was innocent, that it covered our sin. We call that atonement. He atoned for us. When we take this, we are saying that we believe that when he rose from the grave, he gave us a mission before he ascended to the Father, which was go make disciples, which means... Go help others grow. When we take the Lord's Supper, 
we are confessing, yes, I want to be a part of this work. I want to be celebrating that I'm saved. I want his help to be filled to the brim, and I want to be a part of helping others be filled to the brim. And we are saying, I am trusting God that he will do it. Let's pray. Father, as we think on these things, as we consider how, when to take the cup, the bread, I pray that you would convince us, that I pray that this would be a holy moment where we are making a covenant with each other, that we are reminding each other that we're in this together. Oh God, I, I need to just say thank you so much for those people that have prayed for me. I thank you so much for those people who have prayed for those in this congregation that are leading us to take this communion together. Lord, let us be a part of this. Fill us to the brim with your knowledge of your will. I pray that you be glorified. We love you. For Jesus' name and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, as the Spirit leads you, we're going to have a station in the back, a station in the back, and a station right here. Praise team's just going to sing a song reminding ourselves, celebrating that he is great. His faithfulness is good. So as you're led, just go. Take the cups, take them apart, take the bread, and take the cup. Mm -hmm.